And as I am going to read uh, Virginia's intro, do note this is being recorded and we will have it on our website within the next couple of days. So Virginia is a recipient of the Yale Drama Award, the Winning Writers Award, the Princess Grace Award, anti directing and the Playwright Center Jerome uh, Fellowship. Her works include Your Healing is Killing Me, Blue, which I love, uh, The Banza Monologues, co-written with Irma Mayorga, and also Conversations with Don Gurito. In addition to plays, she has created a body of work that is interdisciplinary and includes multimedia performance, dance theater, performance installations, guerrilla theater, site-specific uh, interventions, and community gatherings. She has taught writing for performance at the university level as a public school teacher in community centers, women's prisons, and in the juvenile correction system. She holds an MFA in writing. Uh, for performance from the California Institute of the Arts and is the Mellon Foundation Playwright in Residence at Caramia Theater in Dallas, Texas. So welcome, Virginia. We are so excited to hear from you today. I'm excited to be here with you today. So I, uh, I should preface this talk by saying I'm a complete Luddite and um, was born before the internet ever existed. So how is my sound? I tried to do earphones and wasn't able to. You're good. So my understanding in terms of format and what we're going to do is I'll, I'll speak for a bit and then we'll have some questions. Absolutely. Um, I'm hoping to not speak for a long bit, um, but that doesn't always work out. <laughs> so, and I'm asking everybody that is in the Zoom room to, um, to be patient with me as I try to put together some sort of disparate thoughts into something cohesive. And um, so stay with me for the ride, please. And I would love then to have a conversation. I have some other things um, that I'd like to share too, but they may come after the questions. So I'm gonna share a chunk of work with you and then we'll have a conversation and then perhaps I'll share some more work with you. We'll see, we'll see how it goes in this new um, world of Zoom interfacing and performance talks. I believe in the power of telling our stories, that memory is in fact a political act and that valuing our stories teaches us that we are necessary in this world, that what we say, dream, believe matters. I was an activist before I was an artist. My political training in Marxism, women of color feminism, and Texas Mexican anarchism taught me to examine the intersections of the material, economic, political, social, and cultural forces impacting a community. As a theater maker, my artistic investigation centers on how those forces persist in time and space and across generations. Stylistic elements that have become characteristic of my work, such as circular storytelling, overlapping narratives, repetition, and the collapsing of time and space are reflections of how I move in the world. I have never arrived anywhere in a straight line, so I don't know how to tell a story in that way. I am the daughter of a working class white man and a Chinese Mexican immigrant. Grow I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, a Mexican majority city at a complicated crossroads where the deep south meets the west meets the borderlands. In South Texas, we dance in a circle counterclockwise. In the back of dark bars without windows, I learned how a community takes over space, how a people move, transcend the present moment, how a people dream. I want to write and direct plays that are in a constant state of motion. Music playing, voices overlapping, and bodies that can't stop dancing, which to me is the same as dreaming. But sometimes, sometimes my entire body feels such a profound sense of sadness that I just cannot move. There is no inciting incident. I'm sharing that with you to say that writing anything right now in these times has been a challenge for me, anything, anything at all. Since the onset of the pandemic, I've written two very short four-page stories, and I'm beginning to think that that might be my limit 
four pages. I can't seem to write more than that. And I've never written as a daily practice, but I do journal quite often. I haven't written anything in my journal since I've been back home in Austin. When the pandemic forced me to go home, I realized that I'd spent the past two years that I lived in Texas running away in a sense, sometimes out of necessity as I try to piecemeal a living as a working artist in this country. So much of my life as an artist has felt uncertain, untransient, unstable. I had not been home in a very long time and I have not felt home anywhere for at least the past decade. I once had a friend, anytime that I would talk about not feeling at home, he would suggest that I read Althusser. Home is a four letter word, he'd say. I've read Althusser. I still have this longing for home. Maybe it's because I come from a long line of runaways and refugees that tried to make home in places that did not want them. Maybe because growing up, the home I lived in never felt safe. Alone in my empty house with nowhere to run, I had to sit with a deep sense of loss and a feeling of overall neglect. I had neglected my house, my relationship, countless friendships, my health, and really for a while, I just fell out. I cried a lot and slept a lot until I couldn't cry or sleep anymore. And then I started to clean. This is something I learned from my Chinese Mexican mother, open the windows, burn the incense, light the candles, sweep out the old, wake up in the morning, do it again. Open the windows, burn the incense, light the candles, sweep out the old, wake up in the morning, do it again. Do it again and again and again until something, anything changes. A limpia, a ritual. I did this for several weeks. Most days, it was all I could do. And I thought if I could clear my space, I could make way for something new. Unlike my nephews and my nieces, I didn't have to leave my home to work. Unlike my sisters, I was not sick. But what actually is my job? You see, art and career had gotten entangled. And I've been trying to untangle them for quite a while, even before the pandemic. I felt like I was being given an opportunity to be an artist without having to think about making a living because I'm currently in this new three-year residency that happened to coincide with the pandemic. So I have a salary. What choices will I make if I do not have to work so hard to figure out how to make a living? What does it mean to be an artist now? What is my practice? And slowly, very slowly, I started to move again, started to realize that my practice, even as a writer, begins in my physical body. I make art, I make work in an art form that is about the body. In addition to neglecting my house, my relationship, countless friendships, my health, I had neglected my own body. There is something about that I'm sure that is connected to how I process emotions. Sometimes the world is too much for me and I have to disconnect. When I'm feeling a sense of disembodiment, checked out, moving, 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 keep moving is what I have to do to keep me from falling apart. Alone in my empty house with nowhere to run, I let myself just fall apart. I started to realize that I in fact could do very little control very little. At the most basic level, at a moment when I was being told to stay at home, the only thing I felt I had any control over was my own body. I've returned my attention to my body, my physical self, moving on a daily basis. It is the only thing I do with consistency right now. My body, this body, breath and voice, my only weapons in a global pandemic. Just three hours from the border, I spent much of my childhood at my grandmother's house in Monterrey with my uncle, Andres. We always arrived at her house late at night. A single light bulb hangs from the ceiling in the kitchen. Andres cooks, serves me coffee, pan, and eggs that stick to my stomach, keeping me from ever feeling hungry. Everyone is talking at the same time, mostly in Spanish, which I barely understand. So I sit quietly eating, trying to listen to the overlapping voices 
and the stories as they unfold. I learned something about chosen family long before I learned of that concept from my queer comrades and, and comadres. Not the family Ingalls talks about in the origin of family private, family private property in the state. I still have that book though, all tattered and worn, but I'm not talking about that family. What my mother taught me, what the queers taught me, what Andres taught me was something different, something old, something that predates capitalism. They taught me something about kinship, community, and care for one another. Andres was not my blood uncle, but he was my tío. Andres and my grandfather were merchants. They sold fruits and vegetables in the Mercado Colon after my grandfather died. My uncle left the business, but not after helping several of the men who worked for him start businesses of their own. Because of this, Andres always had an endless supply of groceries. I remember going with him to the market to pick up boxes of fresh fruits and vegetables that we never paid for. And we'd come home and he'd give some of those groceries away to the neighbors. I asked him about it once and he responded by saying, Nadie va a tener hambre aquí. No one is going to go hungry here. And I learned that in order to survive as a people, that we would have to make sure that no one went hungry. There's actually a word for this in Chinese, and I can't remember what it is, but I've never forgotten the lesson. Nadie va a tener hambre aquí. The first immigration legislation in the United States that targeted a people based on nationality was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which effectively pushed the Chinese into Mexico. And there was this elaborate system of falsifying documents that was created, an underground system of making papers from China to Cuba to San Francisco to Mexico for those people that wanted to cross back into the United States. And the Chinese that crossed, they did so as Mexicans. So there's a joke that a scholar has saying that the Chinese were actually the first undocumented immigrants from Mexico. In this moment of renewed anti-immigrant hysteria, an old story in this country, I'm inspired by my people's insistence that their history, their story, their survival, their very existence not go undocumented. In this moment when movement itself is under attack with the travel ban, border wall, for-profit detention centers, I am impelled to create a body of performance about moving bodies and porous borders. The question of documentation, having documents, being documented, has become a central part of my investigation as an artist. It is why as a theater artist, someone who works in an ephemeral art form, it's the reason why I also write books. The books, the text, become my papers. They are the proof that we existed. They are the document of a people's history, imperfectly erased. The first poem I ever read publicly was in the juvenile detention center in Austin, Texas. Over 15 years later, this has continued to have a lasting impact on my work. Prisons, both literal and metaphorical, the boxes people try to put us in and state violence are tropes that recur in my writing and the performances I direct. I make theater in part in an attempt to liberate myself from confinement, conventional roles, norms, and structures an attempt to imagine freedom. Recently, a comrade challenged me with a question that I couldn't answer. How can art set our people free? My art practice is rooted in being free, an act of personal liberation. But really, I couldn't answer the question because the question wasn't metaphor, it was material. How can art get our people out of cages, detention centers, prison? As an artist, I do believe that it is my responsibility to be an abolitionist. And in this country, prison abolition seems like a dream, but I am a dreamer. And I have to keep asking myself that question that he asked me, how can art set our people free? Whether I'm at a kitchen table, a classroom, a theater, a parole hearing, or over bourbon, how can art set our people free? 
I have to keep asking that question again and again until we abolish all prisons and detention centers in this country, eliminate all cages and borders. I believe that art lives in the unknowing, in the questioning, in the imagining of the impossible, and in the creating the conditions for the impossible to exist. As an artist, I want to create ambitious work that is transformative, that demands we listen to our dreams, that we listen to ourselves and to each other, that incites movement. I want to make work that sets people free. Growing up in San Antonio, our house was often the site people would stay for a day, a month, a year, after crossing a border we didn't agree to or create. We have to be willing as artists to create safe houses for others, to ensure that no one goes hungry, to speak to each other across lines drawn in the desert sand, the borders created by colonialism, the walls erected by capitalism. If theater is in fact necessary, we must work towards creating a theater that in its very process offers cultural models for social and political interaction that reflect the world that we imagine, the world that we dream. If theater is in fact necessary, it must actively fight against systems that dehumanize and criminalize, and it must in fact do so by doing work that is necessary, pulled from somewhere deep inside, too far back for any of us to really remember, and yet we recognize it. We feel it in our own bodies when we see it, when we hear it. As artists, I do believe that we have to be abolitionist. And my greatest creative project as an artist is to imagine something, something better, where our dreams matter, where as a people, we are free. Wow, Vicky, that was, that was amazing. You said so much in a few minutes. Um, I, I want to process it. Uh, and you told us so much about you and just the way obviously you put words together was magical. Um, and so I'm gonna allow people if they wanna ask questions, I have tons, but I wanna let other people speak first if they would like. So if anyone has a question, if you're comfortable putting on your video, if you're not, that's fine. You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, I'll give a few moments and then if not, I'll definitely take advantage of that opportunity. Hey. I have a one little question. So like, um, what work do you like uh, do? Like you, you work in prison systems and stuff like that, right? I'm a theater artist. And so I work in a, a lot of different places, but the prison is, is one of the places that I work in. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually ended up, Zoom is so weird to me. So it's, it's very difficult to read when one, I'm reading from my computer and so I don't see anybody and then everybody has their cameras off. So I feel like I'm reading to my dogs in my kitchen. And so it's, very, it's a very strange thing to me. And so I got very nervous when they asked me to speak for 40 minutes. I thought that that was way too long. So I, I cut a section of the piece that actually was talking about the work that I did in uh, recently in a prison in Arizona um, outside of Phoenix. And what we did was the adaptation of a novel called Their Dogs Came With Them by Elena Maria Viramontes. And um, that novel is about the building of six intersecting freeways in East Los Angeles, which, and it went right through the center of a neighborhood, which essentially cut off East LA from the rest of Los Angeles. And so it's a story about displacement. And I was commissioned to write the, the play by a theater in Tucson named Borderlands Theater. And when they asked me what did I need in terms of the development, I said, if I'm writing a piece about displacement, I want to work with people that are most affected by displacement. And to me, um, in the United States of America, one population that we don't often think of in those terms are people that are in prison. Um, one, they're being displaced from the communities that they come from. And then once you're inside of the prison, 
people get displaced on a regular basis inside of the prison. So people have to pack up and get moved to different cells or get moved to different units. And, and so that, that feeling of displacement is, is a sort of constant feeling. And I had been working with an organization in, um, in Phoenix called Humanities Behind the Walls uh, for quite some time, for a number of years. And this coincided with folks on the inside, women on the inside and, and trans folks on the inside saying that they wanted to establish a theater, that they wanted to make a theater. And, um, and so I was talking to them at one point and said, well, what gets in the way of you doing that? Like, why can't you do that? What, what are the challenges? And uh, one of the things that they said is that it was difficult for people to commit. It was difficult for people to stay consistent. And I said, well, you know how you get people to stay consistent when you're making the theater? And they said, how? And I said, you, you make a play, like you, you put on a play. And so what if we put on a play in, inside the, the prison? And uh, when I did that, I did that with the only resource that I had was, again, this thing of like my, this body being my only resource. Like the only resource I had was myself when I offered myself to, to do a, a play inside of the prison. And then like after a lot of conversations, we landed on wanting to do this particular play inside of the prison. And we had a, we had a developmental process from page to stage. I went into the prison a couple of times to do some workshops, but from page to stage, meeting three to four times a week, we had a developmental process from August to December. So I got to work with folks from August, August, September, October, November, December for five, five, almost six months. I got to work with folks on really getting the script the way that I wanted. So I had a dramaturg that was on the inside. Um, I had 17 actors on the inside. All of the folks that were in the theater read the book. And so they had their own conversations about what the adaptation looked like in comparison to the book. Things that I had taken out that they wanted to keep in. Um, the dramaturg was very clear. At one point I had taken out, um, the, uh, there was a homeless character in the piece, uh, a homeless woman, and I took her out of the, the text, out of the narrative. And she was like, this is a play about displacement and you just cut the homeless lady's story. Like, do you realize how messed up that is? Like put, put her back now, Chavela gets back into the piece, you know? And so she, be, she was a fantastic dramaturg actually. Um, and then what we were able to do by kind of matter of, of circumstance and luck and a lot of grant writing is we were able to match the team that we had inside with professional artists on the outside. So we ended up having a professional director, pro, um, a professional set designer. We brought in, I don't know if I'll ever be allowed to do work in the prisons in Arizona again, but we brought in a full set into a prison and performed it on the yard. So the set designer did this incredible design of sort of um, imagining the neighborhood conceptually. And so there was this sort of abandoned structure that was in the middle of the yard that looked like, you know, like a, like it was the structure of a house. It was where they would put like the tents when it would get really hot. So it was just like the, the, the metal structure of like a house. And what she did is she hung from that structure these signs from the neighborhood. So like, you know, um, invoking the neighborhood. And then on the ground, she did this tart with all the names of the characters that eventually the women also scratched their names into this tart. And it was a, a full, fully realized set that forced you to either look at the women that were performing or to look up at the sky, um, which was an incredible, in the desert is an incredible picture. Um, and then we brought in a four piece Grammy award winning band um, that did the music. So Marta Gonzalez did the music. We brought in a choreographer, Marguerite Hemmings that did the choreography. And it was a fully realized production that we had um, two months to rehearse. And those two month rehearsals were five days a week. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the largest, most, most ambitious project that I've ever done inside of a prison. Thank you. I see a hand, uh, Nico Silva. Oh, that's muted. You're on mute. I, I, I have so many Zoom meetings. I don't know why that keeps on happening. I know. Um, because this is weird. 
Thank, thank you so much for your performance. Uh, it was very powerful. Uh, thank you for your time and your existence. I wanted to kind of touch on, uh, well, I had kind of two ideas of what I could ask, but I don't really want to ask two questions, but kind of like what your training was before the MFA, like how that, how that uh, affected your, your MFA program and after. But I think the question that I really want to ask is, um maybe for the audience i don't know who the audience is but maybe myself too uh what was the process like for getting your current fellow i mean uh your current um artist in residence and like how um how does it feel to be you know in, in residence as opposed to maybe like the freelance or or doing the kinds of things that you were doing uh before the residence yeah, so before MFA, when I say that I wrote my first poem inside of a juvenile detention center, I was a high school teacher um, working in Austin, Texas, and at the time working at a high school that was very racially and um, and uh, very racially divided and also very much divided by socioeconomic class. And so it was a bust in school. So at the time, George Bush was governor, George Bush junior was governor and he was running for president and his daughters went to that school but also the poorest of the poorest in, in east um austin went to that school and so it was like this it was a very contentious space and what i was seeing in that contentious space is that even though latinos were um the um you know it was like half and half like it was pretty even in terms of of, of numbers uh in terms of representation that there just wasn't like people really were like literally getting pushed to the side and so when you would walk into the school the first floor was predominantly black like in terms of people that were like hanging out were predominantly black you'd go to the second floor and the second floor was literally where all the resources were so that was the the library the counselor's office the gt classes um there was a red carpet like literally a red carpet there and that's where all the white kids hung out and then you went to like the third floor and the third floor was divided between Chicano and Mexican. And so like, like there was actually a dividing line where like right here was all the Chicanos and right here were all the Mexicans, right? And so that, that relationship was so contentious inside of that school that I started working more and more with artists, even though I wasn't an artist myself. And the reason why I started to do that is because I felt like artists were able to bring something into the school that nobody else was. And so, um, you know, we had workshops and we made things and we wrote things and and one of the programs they were doing, um, they were bringing these kind of world class poets to go teach in the juvenile detention center. And so I said, well, if you're going to bring those folks into Austin, I also want them to come to my high school. And so I started collaborating with the organization that was doing that. And one of the kids that I was working with asked me to write a poem and at which point I told him that I actually wasn't a poet, that I was just a teacher. Um, and luckily there was somebody there that had better pedagogical practices than me and said, no, you better go home and write that kid a poem tonight. And so when I did that, I tell this story because when I did that, I read the poem to the group that was there and Sharon Bridgeforth, who is an artist, happened to be one of the poets that were selected that year. And she sort of picked me up and said, I really want you to take writing classes with me. And I um, kind of fought for a long time, but I respected her a lot. And so I did it because I liked her, you know? And so uh, when I started taking writing classes with her, she continued to offer opportunities that exposed me more and more to art. So it was like through her classes that I learned about the urban bush women, that I learned about Bhutto dancing, that I learned the work of um, Daniel Alexander Jones, Adrian Kennedy, Eric Inn, and I just got exposed more and more to art. And so this thing that I was trying to do for my students, which was like open up a space for them to find their own voice and for them to claim space, was something that ended up happening for me too. And so that's sort of how I became an artist. And so I have, and, and it was an incredible training because at the time in Austin, Austin used to be a place where rent was very, very cheap. That's not true anymore. So rent used to be super cheap, which meant that you could live, I mean, there's a whole video about the slackers that David Linklater um, uh, directed that talks about Austin being a slacking town because you could have a part-time job and be a full and be an artist so it's like you didn't need i was a school teacher and i thought that i was just rich like i had like all the resources in the world 
because you know rent was cheap the cost of living was cheap and so there were so many artists in Austin at that time. So some of them that I've already mentioned, Roy Carlos, Lisa Darmour, Katie Pearl, Sharon Bridgeforth, Eric Inn, um, these incredible artists. And I was surrounded primarily by black queer artists um, and primarily by black um, women queer artists. And so I often have this joke that I didn't know that black queer women didn't run like the American theater, like the field of American theater until I went to graduate school. And so my training was always with, um, my training was with black women. My training was in queer theater. My training was such that there wasn't a separation of like theater only being a play. So theater was anything that you could perform. And so installation was theater, protest was theater. Because um, CalArts is, Cal is more experimental than and that's other- that's how I got to CalArts because I was working in this vein of like anything can be theater, which I believe is true. A football game is theater, you know, anything can be theater. And so CalArts is an incredibly experimental school. And the reason why I applied there is because at the time they were the only place that was offering a writing for performance program. It wasn't playwriting, it was writing for performance. And so that's how I ended up there. And I discovered that because the way that I went to my MFA is I wrote a list of who I wanted to study with. Um, Robbie McCulley, um, Susan Laurie Parks, Jessica Hagedorn, Audrey and Kennedy. Those were the four people that I wanted to study with. So I, I wrote down those names and that got me searching, like, where are they? In some cases they weren't teaching. In some cases they had just left, just um, um, Susan Laurie Parks had just left CalArts. So in some cases they were gone. Um, and then I ended up at CalArts, um, even though it's an experimental school, it is also still, you know, I think it's less white than most MFA programs, but it, but it still is a, a, a primarily comes from a white, um, a white experimental tradition um and and though that's shifted there's there's a lot of stuff that they're doing cross-border et cetera, et cetera, that i could talk about but at the time my mentor was and, and at cal arts mentorship matters like who you apprentice with who you mentor with actually really matters um, because that's who you spend most of your training with most of your time with and my mentor was carl hancock rux who is a multidisciplinary artist and so to answer your question, my training was as a multidisciplinary artist with multidisciplinary artists. And my training has always been, for the most part, with multidisciplinary artists of color, um, with this, an exception of kind of like a handful of folks. As the, um, and I think that that was very formative. Uh, however, when I went to get my MFA, my mentor, who is a multidisciplinary artist, made me write plays. And so you had to do six, performance pieces and you could do anything you could do an opera you could take people on a walk you could i mean anything like cal arts really you, you can perform naked in an elevator like whatever your six pieces are right they could be anything that is performance but my mentor was like no you're gonna write six plays i was the only one that was given the mandate you will write six plays and part of it i think was because i was a little bit like this and I didn't have a, I did not have a training in Western theater traditions, like at all. That wasn't even a reference point for me. Um, I saw Othello was the very first play that I'd ever seen performed of, of Shakespeare. Um, and I saw that as a graduate student. I was 31 when I saw it. And even that I saw as an all female cast. So even that was already like a little bit, like it wasn't a traditional Shakespeare play, but I was like, oh my God, Shakespeare. I had no idea, you know, like I just didn't come from that tradition. And so what Carl did in terms of his training was like, no, you're gonna learn that tradition. And part of why you're gonna learn that tradition is that you already break the rules because you just do what you want to do. But you're, you're, you need to understand what, you need to understand how you are in conversation with all these other types of traditions. And so I did that for three years and then it must have been like three years after I had graduated from my MFA. I still have a very good relationship with Carl Hancock Rux and it must have been three years after I graduated after my MFA. I wrote him to tell him that I was directing this really large scale processional um, installation in front of the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. And he was like, oh, thank God you're not writing plays anymore. You're such a terrible playwright. <laughs> at a certain level was true like I always when I when I try to make something fit into a play it's kind of a battle so for me blue is actually my most traditional 
play play format. Although their dogs came with them is also very much like it has an arc, it has a, you know, all of those things. As the, um, and then in terms of this residency, you know, something that is true that you hear often when you're in training programs is that relationships are everything in theater. And, and that really is true. Relationships are everything in theater. People advocate for you in ways that you can't imagine based on who you know. And so in some ways we can talk about that, you know, very negatively. It's just like, oh, people know people, people, you know, open doors. But in other ways, it really is about who you want to be in conversation with. And so I know that there are ways in which people had advocated for me that I did not know until much later that I was in conversation with. And the Whiting is one of those examples. Getting the Whiting Award, I mean, she, she says it publicly, I, I was nominated for the Whiting, even though this is supposed to be secret, but I was nominated for the Whiting through Metalia Cruz. And, you know, it's just like, I, de I developed that relationship with her, not because she was Metalia Cruz, but because I loved her work. I loved her writing, you know, and she has been an incredible mentor to me. And so Got a Theater, which is where I'm in residence at, um, was the very first theater to produce my work professionally. And so the Panza Monologues was my very first touring show and Caramia presented it. Um, Caramia produced Blue um, and Caramia recently last summer did a workshop production of my solo show, Your Healing is Killing Me, that somebody else was performing. Um, they did a workshop production. And so it was in that workshop production that I said to them, like, listen, there's this grant from the Mellon Foundation to Mellon. have a three-year residency. And what would you think about me being in your house for three years? And so I really feel like it's me, um, it, it's that, that I really do feel like I'm a visitor in someone else's house. And so Karami is the theater, I'm a visitor in their house for the next three years. The residency is completely open. So I can do really whatever Karami and I decide that we want to do. Um, I, I am very fortunate Global pandemics suck, they're terrible, they're awful for the world. They have shown you know, the, the, the incredible inequities that exist in this country. Um, for my work, it has been amazing. I am, I'm very fortunate to start my residency at the onset of a global pandemic, um, because what it means is that in the next three years, when theater doesn't even know what theater means anymore, I have a salary. I have I have a place to work. I have, you know, I have stability. And I think that what is true is that when you have stability, you can have movement. And so anytime that I talk about like what this present moment means from theater, I am nothing but excited about it. Because part of what it means is that everything that we used to know to be true about theater no longer works. We do not have the physical space of theater in the same way that we had it before. And so then the question becomes, what are we gonna make? As artists, what are we gonna make? And in some cases, theaters have done things like made their theater into a mutual aid space. And so Jack Theater in New York City, they opened the doors and said, everybody, this is the place where you can come and get food, you know, and they, they teamed with the Mutual Aid um, Society. And so I think that there's all sorts of different possibility of what theater can be uh, now. And that is exciting. Um, I say that after having lost all of my work in a period of 24 hours, um, so for the next two years, any shows, any gigs, any all of that was my calendar was wiped clean in less than 24 hours. And I think the only thing that, um, although I, I read about that moment of like kind of falling out, after coming out of that fallout, I have been able to be incredibly optimistic and hopeful because I have some sense of stability, right? Um, but in this moment, I feel like we're having conversations both as artists and as a nation that I, some of them I never imagined having. I never imagined that as a nation, we would have a conversation about defunding the police in my lifetime. I never thought that would be part of a national conversation. Whatever side you land on it, that we would be talking about it on CNN. It's like, every time I hear it, I'm like, oh my God, we're talking about defunding the police again. Like how, did, like, how are we having this as a national conversation? And so there's these moments where I feel incredibly hopeful and excited. And then there are these moments when I, I feel an, an incredible amount of despair. And so it's like these kind of like ocean waves. But the Karamiya residency came because of a relationship that I already had and because of the Mellon Foundation. Um, the Mellon Foundation at this moment has 
and has um, funded an incredible amount of work. And so even the work that I did at the prison, I was in residence at ASU at the time through the Mellon Foundation. Um, that was a Mellon Foundation mm. residency. So it's really, if you think about my last four years of my career, the last four years of my, or, or the, last, the last year and the, the three years forward. So four years of my career, you know, the chunk of my money that has supported me is the Mellon Foundation. And, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit scary because what happens when the Mellon Foundation has different funding priorities? You know, what does it mean that one foundation has funded my, my work, you know? But, but then I'm also re wondering like how we can, you know, support more playwrights in that residency or like, not that we necessarily have to make a, a foundation, but like how we can, because as a working artist, you probably know off the top of your head, like several residencies that you can apply to, but I'm wondering like if we can make more residencies, e even in, in our region, like El Paso, maybe someone has an extra like room or a house or something like that. I'm a total, like, forgive me, um, professors. I'm a total residency whore. I love residencies. Um, and I love them because they have a beginning and they have an end, right? So you know from this time to this time, if it's a week, if it's a month, if it's a year, if it's three years, from this month to this time to this time, this is how I'm spending my time. And so let's see if I can show you. I'm going to take you guys to my backyard. So um, one of the things that we've been talking about with our house in Austin, Texas, is how do we make this a, a, a space for other artists to come without any obligations? So if what they're doing is that they just, they just need some time to think and rest, that they can come to our house. And so if you, I don't know, can you see this? So like my partner built these hammocks. Oh, nice. We used to have a huge tree there that just fell down. Awesome. The, this um, garden and we have an extra room. And, and one of the things that we're going to start doing in a new year is doing exactly that to the artists that we love and that we respect is saying that like, our home is yours. So if you need to come because you're working on an exhibit or you're working on a show or, or you're working on a book, or if you need to come because I don't want to figure out how to pay rent this month. Like I'm tired. And, and that would happen to me when I was in New York, especially when you're dependent on a gig economy, you get tired. And so there, it, like, what are the moments when artists need to just say like, hey, I'm gonna come to your house for a month where I don't have to worry about making money, making food. I don't have to worry about those things. And I, so I think that this thing that you're saying is like going back to the talk, nadie va a tener hambre aquí. How do we support each other? And how do we support each other's work? And for me, that's a small, for me personally, that's a small circle. Like there's a small circle of artists that I wanna hold tightly and closely and support with everything that I have, you know? Um, with this residency, one of the things that's been nice is that we also have like residency monies and that's given to us, like we, I don't have to approve it through the theater. So I get a chunk of change that's just mine to do whatever I want to in terms of development. So it could be that I develop a play, it could be that I take a vac that I go to Greece for a couple months for research, it could be that I take a class, you know, all those things. And I've been using that development money to pay other artists to collaborate with me on projects that I don't want to, really on projects that I don't want to have any constraints in terms of product. Like we're just exploring this thing. And so I don't, I don't want your theater to get like all freaked out about like, oh, it needs to be turned in by this time or that time. Like we're, we're just exploring a thing. And so the first thing that I did with Karamiya Theater was a virtual piece called A Farm for Meme, which is part of what that garden is too. Is, and, and A Farm for Meme was about the building of the South Central Farm in Los Angeles and then the eventual destruction of the farm. And, um, and that was a virtual piece. That was one of the four pages that I wrote. That was a four page virtual piece that ended up becoming a 30 minute piece. And that piece really is the next three years of my residency at Karamiya. And the, the residency is about what seeds I will plant. And so what I've asked them to do, the farm was built on an empty lot. So I've asked them over the next three years that I'd be given an empty lot and that all of my work happened 
out of that empty lot. And so that's kind of my big project with Garamia is like what we make in that lot. Thank you so much for all that. Sorry, last, last thing that's connected to this thing about like residencies, programs, relationships. So many times when I deal with students, like they want to know like, well, what do I sign up for? Like, how do I, how do I workshop my work? How do I do? And often, how do you get published into Yale Press? <laughs> how do I get published into Yale Press? How do I do that? And sometimes they ask that question without having written the play. Like one time I sat down, I did this whole workshop with somebody and I was like, what, what is your play about? And he was like, well, I haven't written it yet. And I was like, well, why are you worried about getting into Yale Press or, or publishing here or doing this if you haven't, like write the damn play. So the first thing is that we do our work. And then the next thing, I often like in the early part of my career, like I'm not a networker. I'm not like, that's not my, that's just not my MO. So I get so angry, like when certain convenings would happen or like whatever else. And then I realized well, like, those just aren't my people. Like those aren't the people that I want to be in conversation with. And so as I started becoming more and more clear about who my people were, one, I could look at their trajectory and how they made a life. And then two, like I just had conversations that were better, you know, like, oh, I actually like having a conversation with you, you know? And so I think that that's really key for people that are just starting out is like work. First of all, like do your work, find your people, keep working. And, and, and that's how opportunities begin to present themselves. I have been both incredibly lucky and incredibly strategic. And so when I went into CalArts as an MFA student, I asked everybody, what are you gonna do when you graduate? You know, and I was going to school with very wealthy people. So they were like, oh, I'm gonna go to Hawaii for a year. Oh, my parents are gonna produce my play in New York when I graduate. Like, I mean, like, it's like crazy things. Like, I went to school with the Amundsons. Like, they have their names on buildings in LA, you know? And so I'm like, we are clearly not in the same situation. Like, I'm the daughter of a mechanic. Like, what, like, what am I gonna do when I graduate? And so I was very strategic about how I did my MFA and blue was the very first thing I wrote as an MFA student. And I kept bringing it back to all the workshop classes. I brought it back, brought it back, brought it back, brought it back to the point that they had to have a private meeting about whether or not I was writing other plays. They were very concerned that the only play that I had written was blue. And I was like, Oh no, I got all these other plays over here, but I'm not going to leave with six plays that aren't fully realized. I'm gonna leave with one play that's gonna get me something. And if I leave with that one play, then that's gonna buy me some time to work on some other things. And so I think that that's like, I was super, I was super strategic about that because I was clear that when I left school and I left in the middle of the worst recession that we've ever experienced in the middle of the depression, you know, since the depression, um, you know, when that whole recession happened during Obama's presidency, I left at that time when that, when that recession hit I was very clear that I wanted to be a working artist. And, um, and I have been for the past decade, you know, and so I, I, I've made a lot of sacrifices. I don't know if it was always the smartest thing to do. Like sometimes I should have just gotten a job and not been on the road, but, um, but I've been a working artist for the past decade. And, and I think it is because I've been both lucky and strategic about how I, who, who I'm in conversation with and what is the work that I'm doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I, this is why I said I wasn't going to talk for 40 minutes because I have really long answers to questions. <laughs> no, we love it. Thank you. We have about five minutes left. Um, so if you want to take more questions, Vicki, or if there was additional yes. ones to share, you yeah. know. More questions. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, I really appreciate the presentation, uh, your story. I thought it was very powerful. So thank you. Gracias. Thank you. All right, if no one else has a question, um, Vicki, I, I, I love the language um, that you use and you talked about when you were, you know, with your deal, not really your deal and not understanding Spanish. Can you talk about how language or not knowing language may have influenced some of your work? Absolutely. This question of translation is a really big, is a really big thing for me. Um, it's actually another section that I took out at the top. Um, but I, I always grew up like when I went to Mexico, I am one of three children 
my sister's first language was Spanish um, because my sisters were raised in Mexico when my father went to Vietnam. They're 10 and 11 years older than me. So when my father went to Vietnam, they were raised in, in, in Mexico. And so their first language was Spanish. Um, even though I was always surrounded with Spanish, I just had a hard time picking it up. Like I'm just not good with languages. I eventually studied Spanish as my, my BA and became a Spanish teacher in the public schools. But if you speak to me now, like my Spanish is still actually incredibly terrible. I have terrible pocha Spanish. As the, so, but when I grew up in, I, but, so I grew up going to Mexico a lot. It just took me a long time to learn the language. And I, I'm often in the situation when I feel like I know enough of the language to understand when you don't understand me, but I don't always know enough of the language to explain to you what I'm trying to say. And some, in some ways, I feel like theater feels like that to me. I feel like in the way that I work, the way that I make projects, the way that I make theater, I'm often in rooms with artistic directors or with folks where like they don't really understand what I'm saying. And I don't always know how to tell them what I, what I, I know that you don't know, but I don't know how to tell you. And so I think that for me, the ways in which that's affected my work is certainly my, my, my work oftentimes has Spanish in it and now most recently has a lot of Mandarin in it. So, I, I, so I'm, I'm working with different languages, but it also has affected my work in that I feel like you learn about my work in the doing. So again, in terms of relationships, if I can find the theaters or if I can find the partners that trust me and that trust my vision and that trust my work, it's just like, no, just trust me. Like, just watch. Like, let's see, like, let's, let, let's, let's see how this goes, you know? And then in the end, people are like, oh, I get it, you know? But and so that's really affected even, even my process for working is that, that idea of like, oh, I know enough to know that you don't quite get it, but I don't quite know how to tell you. And so one of the, my goals in this three year residency is that I actually write more about my work in addition to making new work is that I start to write a little bit more about what my process is. Cause I know it was very useful to me as a young artist to read like Susan Laurie Park's um, Elements of Style was super useful to me. And so like for me as an artist, it would be really useful for me to like write my own roadmap for my process and my work. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, we're pretty much out of time. Um, and I know there's just so much amazing stuff, but uh, the piece that uh, Vicky was talking about, Farm from Mehmet is recorded in its radio version. It was part of- uh, oh, Yes. Yes, uh, Reunion Revolucion. It's still available on ktep.org. You can listen to it there. And there's also an interview with Vicky about that piece. So uh, I encourage you to look at that because it's, it's amazing and phenomenal. And so Vicky, we thank you so much for your time, sharing your talent with us. Uh, we appreciate it and for putting so many new thoughts in our brains. And so I thank you so much. And I thank everyone for, for joining us today. It was recorded and it will be up on our website probably by the end of the week, if not by Monday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vicky. Everyone stay well.